The Bush Center is a place that calls people to a higher purpose and aims to inspire service to others. Laura and I believe that to whom much is given, much is required. This is the spirit that guides our work. The Bush Center is warm and welcoming. Built on the campus of SMU, my alma mater, we invite visitors through our doors to attend public programming that attracts newsmakers and thought leaders for important conversations around the issues we care most about. The Bush Center is a unique asset. Having a presidential center and an institute combined is something that differentiates us from most places around the country. We're able to go where other people cannot go and access resources that other people can't access. When we talk, people listen. And when we invite, they come. And when we take on a project, we finish it. When you walk into the Bush Institute, you'll see a quote from my presidency on the wall that summarizes the principles we're committed to. It is important that we continue to defend these beliefs. We do that through our three impact centers, domestic excellence, global leadership, and our engagement agenda. Domestic excellence, to be a great country, you should have strong economic growth, great education, take care of your veterans, and develop future leaders. In global leadership, it means promoting global health, advancing freedom and democracy, and empowering women worldwide. And our engagement agenda is how we spread the word about what principled leadership is and the core values we're able to perpetuate. The Bush Institute is making a profound difference in the world. The reason is pretty simple. We don't just do policy and research, we put it into action. Through the Presidential Leadership Scholars Program, we're training rising leaders across the country. Through the work we do on school leadership, where we work with district officials across the country to recruit, retain high-performing principals in our schools. We're helping post-9-11 veterans and their families find employment through our VET Roadmap. We've also created the Warrior Wellness Alliance, a network of organizations that represent over one million veterans to address the invisible wounds of war and connect more veterans to quality care. We wanted the Bush Institute to be a place that improved the lives of people at home and around the world. We teach young leaders from emerging democracies the skills they need to help their countries succeed. We equip women from Afghanistan and the Middle East, North Africa region with the knowledge required to become effective leaders. And we continue to ensure that women in Africa who are surviving HIV AIDS are not dying from cervical cancer. Following the example set by President and Mrs. Bush, these early results inspire us to do more and to help more people. We bring people to this great campus and this great facility, but also online through our publications and thought-provoking journals, we're able to carry the messages around principled leadership and what President Bush's example means to all of us. Having the Bush Center here is really the crown jewel of the campus. Everyone associated with SMU is extremely proud of it. The value of the George W. Bush Presidential Center to Dallas and North Texas, I'd say the state of Texas, is truly incalculable. With SMU, we've hosted conversations with His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, and with business leaders like Jeff Bezos. Our policy programs benefit from the minds and interests of SMU faculty and students. My hope is that the Bush Center will always serve as a place where timeless principles are celebrated, protected, and promoted. We just want to make sure the next 10 years are as great as the beginning years of what we're doing here. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the President and CEO of the George W. Bush Presidential Center, Ken Hirsch. Thank you, and welcome to the Forum on Leadership, and welcome to all those who are watching on our live stream. Um, I want to thank President and Mrs. Bush for hosting this great event, and I especially want to uh, thank them for the, giving us the green light to go ahead. It's an important day. Um, and I want to thank our great board and executive advisory council and all our wonderful supporters and underwriters who have made this event possible. You heard about the breadth and the depth of our work and what it means to us here that we've been charged by President Bush to do is change lives. And we do that really through two ways. We try to approach things the way a presidential center can. We can do that from the top down through policy, um, advocacy and awareness. And we can do it from the bottom up 
by actually running programs that gather attention and make a meaningful impact in people's lives. Whether it be helping veterans through awareness building about overcoming the invisible wounds of war, or actually running a wellness alliance and a veterans leadership initiative. Or our human freedom initiative, where we call out the tyrannical regime in North Korea, we provide policy work for a new administration, and we also raise extra dollars for an educational scholarship for refugees from North Korea who have found their way to this great country. Our leadership programming is really designed to do that. And if we're able to do that and bring that on stage here in our forum, is to bring out the best of what the Bush Center has to offer. Our goal is to bring it to life, and that's what we're doing today and tomorrow. I was stopped recently, um, completely coincidentally, at another event around town by Byron Sanders, who in 2015 went through our Presidential Leadership Scholars Program. And he said, Ken, I just want to say thank you. I said, what are you thanking me for? And he said, you changed my life. I said, Byron, we barely know each other. He said, no, you don't understand. The Presidential Leadership Scholars Program really emboldened me to think about my personal goals. And he was on the board of an organization here in town called Big Thought, which helps kids throughout our region. And he was on the search committee for the new executive director. So in that search committee, he was actually working on trying to find somebody who would fill that role. In the middle of it, he pulled a Dick Cheney, and he said, you know what? I think I'm the guy. And he completely changed his life and went into the nonprofit sector. So he was thanking me for that. Um, as somebody who left my private career uh, and, and took a step back in order to jump into the nonprofit world, um, I, I actually uh, understood what he was talking about. It's a true privilege and honor for me uh, to lead this great group of people and to really help carry the messages that were so inspired by President and Mrs. Bush in their public service. Um, I was 26 years old when I started my private investment firm here in town, and I met a young couple with two little girls who had moved from Midland to Dallas uh, to buy a baseball team. And uh, at that time, I, uh, the gentleman I met before he had to change his first name to Mr. President, um, I, uh, I knew him as somebody that we talked about folks in Midland and, uh, and baseball. What I have come to appreciate, and I wish everybody here could understand, and I hope they do understand, the, the, the true essence of what leadership is and what I've come to appreciate about that man's public service. It's inspirational and it's principled. True leadership is tested when there's no script. And we're sitting here with a library and museum attached across the courtyard, which everybody can go see with your badges. Just go across the courtyard if you take a break. One of the most interesting to me as, uh, documents is actually a, a, a digital display document. In the, after the 9-11 rotunda in the museum, there is a, uh, a, a, a touch screen with the diary of President and Mrs. Bush from 9-11 on that day. And to me, that's a day that had no script. And to watch what happened on that horrific day, to me, shows the essence of what real leadership means. At 9.02 a.m. that day, the second tower was hit. At 9.14, President Bush left the classroom. From 9.15 to 1 o'clock, there's a whirlwind of activity. He's talking to Vice President Cheney, Governor Pataki, Secretary Rice, back to Vice President Cheney. He breaks at 9.44 a.m. Think about that, 9.44, 30 minutes later, and he asked Secret Service to get his daughters and make sure they have extra protection. Back on the phone. Tries to call the First Lady, call doesn't go through. Back on the phone with Secretary Rumsfeld, Vice President Cheney, Mayor Giuliani. He finally gets through to Mrs. Bush at 10.52 a.m. They landed off at Air Force Base in Nebraska at 2 p.m. Security briefings, more intelligence, and more of the noise of the day. At 2.44 p.m., he breaks and places a call to his father, who was on the ground in Brookfield, Wisconsin, and he said, what are y'all doing in Brookfield, Wisconsin? And President Bush 41 said, because you grounded our planes. Um, <laughs> they were on their way to Minnesota for an engagement. Two minutes later, he calls his friend Ted Olson, the Solicitor General, and offers his condolences because his wife Barbara was on Flight 77 that crashed into the Pentagon. He was a dear friend. Then he's back on the phone, meetings the rest of the day. Through, through, through that day, back to, back to Washington, the Situation Room, Secretary Rice, Karen Hughes as policy advisors. Back to the White House, 7.39, he tries to call his daughter Barbara. He finally gets through to her at 7.56 p.m., and at 8.30, he's addressing the country, 34 minutes later. That day, he was a leader, he was a commander-in-chief, he was a husband, he was a father, he was a son, and he was a friend. I find, I always, when I'm walking people through, I stop and I said, please digest this display, because it's amazing. It shows what happens when there's no script. When there's no script, you have two things to rely upon. 
your instinct, and your principles. And those were on display then, and that we hope that it permeates the work that we do here. What we have at the Bush Center is really a unique asset. And it's a unique asset where we're able to take on work that was started by President and Mrs. Bush when they were in the White House, and then new work as the, as the times unfold um, that's inspired by their, by their message. We want to be a positive force about American values, and we support those values of economic and political freedom, less government dependency, and a strong and compassionate country. I dare to find somebody who would argue the other, three, the other side of those three values. And to me, our mission is clear. Because if we engage the world to develop leaders, advance policy, and take action that are consistent with those principles, we will make a big difference. Because policies may change, but principles won't. And all of that will be on display here at the Forum of Leadership, where we will work on being the go-to place for leadership. We'll be able to develop leaders, we'll be able to celebrate leadership, and recognize those qualities that great leaders have. President Bush charged us here to aim high. Aim high and tackle really major important things. And we have that here. On the agenda, we have 43 speakers. That is a coincidence. We did not plan to have 43 speakers. We counted them up and said, did you realize we have 43? So if you're a speaker out here, you can't cancel. You're locked in because we can't have 42 or 44. Um, fate has brought you here. We're going to hear about economic issues from Hank Paulson and Ben Bernanke and Ed Lazier and Terry Duffy. We're going to hear about governing in deeply divided states from John Hickenlooper of Colorado and Susanna Martinez of New Mexico about social challenges and education from Dr. Priscilla Chan, and about medical and technological innovations that are going to revolutionize our lives that have both pros and cons. And of course, we're going to hear from Secretary Rice, Bono, Jeff Bezos, Mrs. Bush, and of course, President Bush about whatever the heck they want to talk about. Also, it's exciting today that we're going to um, uh, begin the work on what was announced yesterday, and it's fitting for our fifth anniversary of, being, of this, these doors being opened on the SMU campus that we've combined the Economic Center at SMU with the Economic Growth Initiative of the Bush Center to create the Bush SMU Economic Growth Initiative, which is going to be a think tank focused on policy recommendations to further economic growth and prosperity here in this country. And we hope that that will be a very wonderful combination of the power to convene and the thought leadership of the Bush Center and our economic growth team, along with a major economics research institute across the street. That should be a very powerful combination, and I'm very excited what that future will bring. And I want to thank all of you, because without your support and your engagement, we couldn't make that happen. Um, we have so many programs here and lots of different ways for people to plug in. I encourage everybody to think about what speaks to them about what we, what we do here at the Bush Center and find fun ways to get involved. My call to action for this crowd is simple. You're going to hear what leadership means. You're going to hear lessons. We're going to hear about what had happened in the past and what people project in the future. If you can take one of the ingredients you hear from one of the panel discussions and apply it somewhere in your life to make a difference, we will have succeeded. And that's our goal. Helping me achieve this goal is my wonderful colleague, um, Holly Kuzmich, who's the executive director of the Bush Institute. She's a veteran of the Hill, the White House, and the Department of Education. Um, she is proof that there are wonderful, smart, caring people who know what they're doing working in Washington. However, we're very, very lucky that she's in Dallas and she's working here on behalf of the American people. It is an honor and please join me in welcoming Ms. Holly Kuzmich. There we go. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you for being here and thank you, Ken. Effective leaders are important in all aspects of society. They drive change and build communities here in the United States and around the world. And developing leaders is central to the work that we do here at the Bush Institute. It's the way that we link policy and thought leadership with action. And leadership never really goes out of style. There's never a day when you don't need new leaders in all kinds of professions, whether it's government, the business sector, healthcare, education, and on and on. And so since the founding of the Bush Institute, we've taken it as our task to develop leaders in several unique ways. We've launched three leadership programs here at the Bush Institute. The first is our Women's Initiative Fellowship, because we know that when you educate and empower women, you improve every aspect of society. So we've worked with women from the Middle East, from North Africa, and from Afghanistan to develop their skills and empower them as great leaders. We've, we've launched the Liberty and Leadership Forum, 
where we train young leaders in Burma on freedom, free markets, and democracy. And we work in Burma because it's a transitioning democracy. And we created the Presidential Leadership Scholars Program in partnership with three other presidential centers. So our presidential center here and the centers of William J. Clinton, George H.W. Bush, and Lyndon Baines Johnson. In that program, we develop mid-career professionals to help them take on projects in communities across the country and around the world. And what makes our programs unique? There are several things that we do here at the Bush Institute that we wanted to make sure make our leadership programs stand out. The first is our access to exceptional leaders and resources. We are able to bring in people like President and Mrs. Bush, business leaders, world leaders, people running nonprofits here and around the world that are really affecting change. Second, every participant in our programs is required to take on a personal leadership project. It's the way that participants come in, identify a challenge that they need to solve, take what they learn in the classroom, and implement it in their life and scale their work. And third, we seek to inspire everyone who comes into these programs, partly through the leaders we, we bring into the program and through the network that we develop. They are inspired to achieve more and have a more expansive view of what they can do. Let me tell you about a couple of the graduates of our programs. Emna Benarab is a 2014 graduate of the Women's Initiative Fellowship. She's a university professor in Tunisia who has a passion for education reform. She took what she learned in the program, went back to Tunisia, and opened a secondary school. And through the two schools that she now runs, serves over 400 students in Tunisia, training them for the global economy. Yan Taik Seng is a 2015 graduate of our Liberty and Leadership Forum. He's a BBC journalist in Burma. He took what he learned about freedom, free markets, and democracy back to his country. And through the radio show that he hosts every week that reaches over 3.2 million people, he's infusing those, uh, uh, those skills and abilities into his radio show. Darren Roberts is a 2015 graduate of our Presidential Leadership Scholars Program. He's a former NFL coach and a Harvard-trained lawyer. He runs the head, he's the center, head of the Center for Sports Leadership at the University of Texas, and he created a project called Captain's Academy, where he works with, with student athletes in the Austin area, and he's created a leadership program for them based on presidential leadership scholars. He's now taking that model. He served over 500 students in Austin and is bringing it across the state of Texas. Those are just a few examples of the over 300 graduates we've had to date in our programs. And we rigorously measure what we do in our work. It's important to inform uh, our work and make sure we're being effective and to tell those who invest in our work that we're making a difference. And so today we're releasing a report called Leadership in Action that details the results of those programs to date. And the important thing that we found is that we're making a difference. We're making a difference in the way that we hoped we would. And let me tell you a little bit about those ways. <clears throat> First, we have looked at the number of graduates who would strongly recommend this program to their friends and colleagues. It's called a net promoter score. It's widely used in industry across this country. Uh, the scores range anywhere from negative 100 to 100. The business community seeks to achieve anywhere from a 50 to a 70. We got an 89, which is extraordinarily high for the programs that we have here at the Bush Institute. Secondly, we build a diverse network in each of these programs. 85% said exposure to and appreciation of a wider diversity of perspectives increased because of being in our Bush Institute programs. Similarly, 85% of graduates report that the programs propelled their personal leadership projects forward. And finally, we see that more of the graduates of our programs feel likely to achieve their long-term vision. When participants came into our programs, only 30% felt that way. By the time they graduated, that had increased to 86%. All of the graduates of these programs are inspiring, and I'm really glad that over the next several days, you'll get to meet a few of them. And when you leave tomorrow, I encourage you to check out this new report, Leadership in Action, that will be, uh, that will be given to all of you upon your departure. 
The report also outlines the other ways that we develop leaders. So for example, we run our school leadership initiative where we work with school districts across the country to recruit, train, develop, and retain high-performing principals in schools across our country. Our First Ladies Initiative works with First Ladies around the world to develop and use their unique platform to affect change in their countries. And our newest program will be the Stand to Veteran Leadership Initiative, launching this summer, where we will create our next leadership program to work with those working to improve veteran outcomes across our country. And I'm really pleased that you'll meet one of the participants of that program tomorrow at lunch. Finally, I'm really pleased now that you get to meet one of the graduates of our program. Daniel Anello is a 2015 graduate of the Presidential Leadership Scholars Program. He's the CEO of New Schools for Chicago. When he came into PLS in 2015, he was new in that role. And he wanted to be able to use what he would learn in that program as the new CEO of that organization. But what he also brought to the program was his personal leadership project. And that was a project to work with parents in the city of Chicago to empower them and give them great educational options for their kids, give them a voice and give them a seat at the table. And through this project, one of the things they had found was that in public high schools in the city of Chicago, there were 292 different applications for public high schools in the city of Chicago, different timelines and different requirements. And think about how challenging that is for a parent, and especially a low-income or working parent, to navigate that system. Well, through his work with Kids First Chicago, they have gotten it down to one common application in the city of Chicago, helping kids and parents and families in Chicago have better educational options. We're really proud of Daniel, proud of his work. It started in PLS. And part of what also drives his work is the core of what Presidential Leadership Scholars teaches, which is values-based and principles-based leadership. And so he's here to share what inspires him to lead and how PLS impacted him. So please join me in welcoming Daniel Anello. You always remember exactly where you were the moment you realize how much something matters. For me, it was my freshman year in my dorm room on the phone with my father. You see, my, my parents, they were teachers, and they taught in some pretty challenging, tough schools in New Jersey. And they were an interracial couple that came together in Newark, lived in Newark, and in the 60s. And my dad describes being three blocks away from the race riots in 1967, and it wasn't shortly after that that they decided that they were going to pick everything up and move. So they moved to the middle of nowhere, upstate New York. More specifically, they moved to Crown Point, New York, where they bought a piece of land on a dirt road, built their own house with 50 miles of woods across the street. And this is the place where they decided they were going to raise three brown boys in a relatively poor all-white mill town. There was my older brother Shane, me in the middle, and my younger brother Gabi. And for us, civil rights and education were absolutely paramount to everything. In fact, you could say dinner was an education for us. Uh, my dining room table that I grew up with was a repurposed East Orange Middle School table with graffiti scrawled across the top. And if you looked hard enough, you could find the gum that my dad had missed on the underside. And so I remember growing up next to Willie Brown on my left and Johnny Day on my right. And for us, college was a destination. It was not an option. But the college going process was something that was foreign to my parents. They had just gone to Newark State Community College. And my graduating class, public school, 20 kids, more of us would get married coming right out of college than go on to college. And so my brother, being the oldest, got first dibs, and he had chosen a school all the way out in Phoenix near my aunt. And uh, when my turn came, I remember my mother sitting me down at that table right next to Willie Brown, rolling out a, uh, a map of, of the area. And she was an art teacher, so she takes out a compass, and she puts it on Crown Point, New York, and she draws a circle. She says, this is as far as you get to go. We can't afford multiple tickets home. So my universe. <laughs> 
And she hands me this Grand Union paper bag full of brochures that have just been collecting at our door. It says, go upstairs and pick a few schools. And so I did. Uh, and I went through the process as many 15-year-olds might in that moment. I, I went through and I picked out all the brochures that I thought had good-looking girls on them. <laughs> Except for one, uh, and I remembered it pretty vividly because for a lot of reasons, and that's this one here. See, I saw, I saw a mixed kid on the cover and I saw me. And I wanted to be this kid. And so the financial aid reward letters come back and this place gave me the best package. And so unbeknownst to me or my family, I went off to one of the best schools in the country, Williams College. And to say the next four years were difficult would be an understatement. They were the most challenging four years of my life. You see, Crown Point Central School at the time just didn't prepare kids for college. We didn't have AP courses. We didn't have calculus. We were just dabbling in pre-calculus my senior year. And so I ended up in all remedial classes, and those were the classes that I struggled in every single day. I was fighting for survival. I was hiding in the back of classrooms. I didn't raise my hand for four years, feeling like the dumb brown kid. But thankfully, Williams believed in me when I didn't believe in myself. I just didn't know how to ask for help or have a compelling enough why to do so. And that takes us back to that dorm room. I remember sitting there in the afternoon, it's about 1 p.m., and I'm studying for Psych 101, which is supposed to be an easy A. And I'm reading this chapter over probably for the fourth time, because that's the only way I knew how to study, was to try to memorize absolutely every single word in a chapter so that I might recall some of it when I got to the quiz. And as I'm trying to get this information to stick and it's just not, I'm thinking, I'm barely getting a C in this class, I'm not sure I'm going to make it through Psych 101, let alone the rest of the semester. And the phone rings and I pick it up and it's my dad. Daniel, listen, we just got back from Phoenix. Immediately, I, the way my parents rationed out plane tickets, I was a little shocked, but he goes on and he's, listen, uh, we lost touch with Shane. We haven't talked to him in a few weeks. So we went to find him. And Daniel, uh, I tracked down his apartment and I managed to convince the landlord to let us in. When I went in, what I found was an empty apartment, a bare mattress, and trash everywhere. And at this point, I remember I'm, I'm sitting on my roommate Jed's bunk as he just in bullet point fashion relays how my brother in just a matter of a few months has developed a crack cocaine addiction and is out on the streets. And I remember in that moment just feeling like I needed something more. The way that my father was sharing the information was not enough. I said, Dad, can I, can I talk to Mom? No. Your mom can't talk to anybody right now. And that hit me like a ton of bricks. See, my mom was the rock, the strongest woman I know, next to my wife. <laughs> she could talk to us anytime, anywhere. And I just remember I could sense through the phone, through her silence, and through my dad's way of just relaying this information, the devastation that they were feeling in that moment. And I, I don't remember the rest of the phone call. I just know I sat back down and I looked at that Psych 101 page and I made a decision. I was never going to put my parents through that kind of pain again. So I asked for help, as hard as it was. And the minute I did, Williams gave me every support. And it never got any easier. But with each small victory, I grew a little bit stronger you see, Williams doesn't let kids like me and my brothers fail. They just don't. And I know that because my younger brother, 
five years later, followed me there. Struggled for the same reasons I did, lack of preparation, but he made it too. I just happened to pick up the right brochure, and Shane didn't. Because of that, I get to stand up here and share this story with you. And he's going to be in a prison cell in Victorville Penitentiary until 2022. Had he picked up a different brochure, I, I can't imagine where he'd be today. But I know it wouldn't be prison. You see, even with two committed parents that thought of education as the gateway, everything, it wasn't enough. We just weren't prepared. You see, I don't think kids should have to fight their self-esteem because of lack of preparation. I go to work every single day thinking about three brown boys and how each and every one of them makes it. To me, education is the great equalizer. And when I look at the disparities of access and opportunity that stratify our country, and even polarize the outcomes in one family, it seems so evident that this is the civil rights issue of our day. But before PLS, I was afraid of this story. Terrified of what it would mean to unlock that door. And PLS changed everything and so much more. See, PLS, helps us understand how the values that we pick up in our journeys are so critical to the why that we do our work. It's embedded in every model, framework, hallway conversation, case study, and it's just reinforced with the incredible leaders, many of the folks in this room who come and share their own personal whys for what they do. I was really apprehensive about telling any of this publicly in the midst of this program when a cohort mate of mine pulled me aside and said, Daniel, you don't, you don't get it. Your story is what helps other people remember their own stories. And so with that, in the last month of this program, I stood up in front of the Chicago, the Commercial Club of Chicago, a room full of the city's most prominent executives, CEOs, and leaders and I told the story about my family and Shane for the first time, publicly. And true to my cohort mate's words, I'm walking off the stage and a Fortune 500 CEO grabs me by the arm, says thank you, and starts to tell me his own story about his own brother. A couple weeks after that, I sent a one-way postcard to my brother Shane in his, in his prison cell just to say I think about you every day. A postcard he responded to. And thanks to PLS, I talk to my brother after 15 years of silence every week. Thank you. You see, Williams helped me understand why I needed to ask for help. But PLS helped me understand and discover how that why fuels the work that I do every day in Chicago for kids. Thank you. Please welcome the George W. Bush Institute's Director of Education Reform, Ann Wicks.